Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to my podcast, The Stephen Sully Study, and this is part of the art series that we're doing at Woodbury House. I've had some incredible guests on recently. I've interviewed uh, Al Diaz, Crash, Coke 2, and now I've got another legend who I, I, I've actually been following for, for some time, a lot longer than the other guests that I've had on recently because of the Richard Hamilton movement. There's a documentary of Richard Hamilton called The Shadow Man, which is absolutely blinding. It's, it's phenomenal. Um, it's on Amazon Prime and it's been received very, very well. And I know in the in the trailer, the next man I'm about to interview, LA2, is is, is featured in there. So as an introduction, uh, thank you for coming on to the podcast, uh, LA2 or Mr. Angel Ortiz. Thank you for having me. As you can see, I have the red Talking about Richard, he's right behind me. Ah, that's quality. So was that a, uh, a collaboration? That was a self-portrait, he just helped me. Oh, right, cool. That's really cool. Well, look, yeah. uh, look, um, LA2, there's so much I want to uh, ask you and, um, you know, t- talk to you about. First of all, uh, just just a bit of background. So I, I asked this to Cope2, I asked this to Al Diaz, I've asked this to any artist that I, I get on my podcast. Um, what was New York like? Because that's not quite naturally where you made your name and quite naturally where you're from. What was New York like back in the 70s and 80s? Well, I was a young little kid back in the 70s and 80s, you know? I was uh, 14 years old Yeah. in the 80s, you know? 10 years ago in the 70s, you know? So, New York always been New York to me. You know, I'm born and raised in New York. You know, nothing has changed for me. You know, I'm still living in New York. I'm here in New York. I'm a true New Yorker. Yeah, yeah. Um, the reason why I'm asking this question, LA2, is because what attracted me to the Richard Hamilton market is, yes, indeed, his paintings, don't get me wrong, but it was more about the, you know, the the how controversial, how kind of, you know, on edge New York appeared back then. Now, obviously, you know, I'm not from New York. I'm from London. I'm from South London. I'm 35 years of age, and I have, I've got no, 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 uh, you know, uh, first-hand concept of what it was like. But what I've read and what I've seen in, like, you know, videos and articles, it was quite a, a quite a dangerous place at times. Well, you know, back in the early 80s, when I was 14 years old, riding on the streets, riding all over the buses, the trains, everywhere, and then um. I met Richard. Richard was a good guy, but, you know, he was ahead of everybody's time, you know? Yeah. He was a real good artist. They did a documentary, The Shadow Man, which I appeared twice in The Shadow Man. And they did a Richard Hamilton, The Shadow Man. Yeah. A documentary where they interviewed me twice. Yeah. And they took me off the interview, you know? Why? But I spoke the truth about Richard and everybody else. You know, that whole documentary wasn't, to me, wasn't no good, you know, because they made him seem like an addict, but he wasn't an addict. He was an artist. Right. And an addict, though. But to me, it was an artist, because that's what we did. We paint. Yeah. But you're, you're, you're in, so when I got introduced to his market in 2000, and like back in the 2013, 2014, <laughs> The trailer that I still watch today, which I show my collectors, clients, and investors, is the one that you're featured in. You're the one talking. Are you actually in the Shadow Man documentary itself? Um, they just show my, some of my tags. They show they show me as a young person. Yeah, you know, and the uh, art, art galleries and stuff like that. So they just show little bits and bits about me. You know. So, yeah. Okay. Cool. So. Um, they show they show they show me in the documentary, but they didn't show me the interview. You know the interview that I gave to them. They never showed it. They never put it up. Okay, so let's let's talk about that then. So what what you um, what you said in the interview, which was meant to actually be on the Shadow Man documentary, what was your take on Richard Hamilton then? Because you said he's an artist. Yeah, he might have had a slight drug addiction, but didn't every single artist back in the eighties and you know from from New York? I don't know every single one of them, because, you know, every single one But when I hanged out with Richard, you know, we paint, we paint on the streets, you know. We wasn't getting high. We were busy tagging up, doing our art, you know. Yeah. And I know Richard, back before he 
painted it the shadows, it was painting the streets and stuff like that. Right. Okay. So Mitchell, Mitchell was a good artist to me, you know. And at one time when I was young, it was in Italy. When I was there in 80, 1983, I was in Italy. And Richard stopped by and he said, oh, hey, why don't you come and tie up the streets in Italy? And we was in Venice. But at that time, I was painting with Keith. And I asked Keith permission, hey, could I go tie up on the streets with Richard? And since I was young, he was like, I like these walls are very, you know, line marks, you know, line marks. So you, you shouldn't go running on the streets with Richard. But hey, Richard went and he painted the streets. You know, that was something very interesting that out in Venice, you would see a shadow in Italy at that time in 83. Obviously, you, you started, started painting uh, your, your tag LA2 and it become quite infamous, you know, in and around where you were you know, where you were from. What, what does that mean, LA2? Where did you get that name from? Well, LA2, LA2 stands for Little Angel, because my name is Angel. Yeah. And I'm little. Been number two, because a lot of the writers had numbers. Los Angeles, California is number one. So I chose number two. So I'm LA2. And that's how I started writing my name, LA2, stands for Little Angel. So, uh, it, and I just started writing it everywhere. Yeah, so, so it, it appears to me that a lot of the artists now, the contemporary street artists, if you want to call it that, they started with a tag and then they morphed or dovetailed into, let's say, uh, a, a style that they've got today. Um, Cope 2, you know, Days, Crash, out Diaz, but he was going by the name Samo, was Jean-Michel Basquiat back in the day. And then obviously yourself. So... LA2 was what you were tagging. When did you start converting over to like a different style and doing actual paintings on canvases? Well, the streets, as for me, was always been my, my canvases, you know. <clears throat> when we went on the streets, the streets are our canvases. The trains are our canvases. Everywhere I wrote my name, it was like a canvas. You know, I, I came from street arts to galleries, from galleries to museums a museum to auction houses. So, and I had my own style, you know, and that's what, back in the day, that other graffiti writers would tell you, it was a lot of competition, you know. Yeah. For us, the graffiti artists, we love to write on the streets. And yeah. the more you put your tag up, the more you become more famous. And that's how it was for me. Yeah. I just started writing and writing and writing and writing. And then, you know, Cause... everybody got it. It is sorry. I think there's a slight delay there on our on our Zoom. But what I was going to say is, um, you know, the streets were your form of almost social media, right? Because today, you know, people use social media to to advertise their, their work and also to sell their work and maybe to you know do different collaborations. But you didn't have that back then. So your form of like getting yourself out there, so to speak, was basically uh, dubbing trains or the streets. And um, what Cope 2 said to me is he would he would kind of attack one particular train line or tube line um, in order to to become a bit famous and take right. over that take over that area. Is that what yeah. you did as well, LA too, or did you do uh, other stuff? Well, that was the video I was painting on the train. Like those the video writers, they rode on the train and they stood on one line. You know, the two lines, three lines the number trains and stuff like that. When I rode on the train, I rode on the train. You know, it was like cat. You know, when we go on the train, it's to ride on the trains. We don't go there to admire people's tag because we we taking a chance of going to the train yards. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And when I went there, I rode on the buses, sanitation truck, I rode at, on the streets. My stuff was basically the streets, you know? I would destroy the streets. I would ride on the sanitation trucks on the buses, everywhere. I would go clubbing, and after the clubbing, I would walk from, there would be Roxy's with the Rocksteady crew, B-Boys, breakdancers, we would dance all day, and then when we're trying to go home, the club end, we would walk from 18th Street, 10th Avenue, all the way to the Lower East Side, so I would walk every avenue, every day. First Avenue, Second Avenue, Third Avenue, A, B, and C, like that. And that's how I became King of New York in 1980. I was like, 
right now I can't tag up on the streets. I feel like tagging up on the streets, but I got my own studio and once I start tagging up on the street, I'm gonna get harassed by the cops and everybody know who I am. So they'll come to my studio and say, LA, you can't do that. Now it's gonna buy ask permission. So, so back in the eighties, nineteen eighties, you said you were like the the, the king or, or almost of uh, of the streets. Um, well, when did you like? How old was you when you started painting? Did you say about fourteen years of age? Well, fourteen years of age, I was in junior high school. I started in public school. <coughs> as a little kid. I started in public school, and then from public school, you know, yeah. Uh, a public school, I went to junior high school, and then I was I was also in the boys club, you know. And in the boys club, you know, our parents would send us there like from three to nine, and there would be other graffiti writers that were writing on the streets that much older than me, and they invited me three to nine. I was like four, from three to eight, I would write the streets club. So, yeah. I, and then at the age fourteen. I think your connection is going again, L.A., Other graffiti writers that was king of the chain was painting the wall, and at the same time Keith was painting the wall. And then I said, "Where is this guy Keith Harry? You know, where's Keith at?" And he was on top of the ladder. And I said, "Hey, why are you asking for LA too?" And he said, "Well, I see his signature all over, you know." And I would like to meet him. I had, he had like thousands of markers, as you can see. I always carry a marker. A real graffiti. So I wrote my name, and he got excited, and we hanged out the whole day, and it got nighttime, and I asked him where you live at, he said, I'm on Bloom Street. He said, hey, I asked him if I could, if you need the help with the ladder? He said, yes. Walked to Bloom Street, he had a yellow taxi hood. He said, would you write your name on the yellow taxi hood in his house? I wrote my name, LA2. We changed numbers. Two weeks later, he called me, he said, LA, come over. I want you to see what I did. And he had he was doing his little dogs, which he was known for, the dogs and the babies. And I said, why don't you fill it in with details, with lines and stuff like that? He filled it in with lines and stuff like that. And then he calls me. Two weeks later, he said, oh, yeah, I sold the painting. And he gave me, I said, what? He said, yeah, I sold the painting. the first time I sold the painting. And he said, I got some money for you. I said, cool. I went over there. I said, but he said, I got $1,400. And it was a verbal agreement back in the days, you know. He gave me $700. He got $700. I went shopping back in the early 80s, you know. It was the Adidas. We had the, I bought my Adidas suit, my Adidas sneakers, the fat laces, and then went to Roxy's and just started dancing and enjoying ourselves. And that's how uh, I met Keith and the rest is all history after that, you know what I'm saying? Keith Harris wasn't a street artist. He was a studio artist. Remember, Keith didn't bomb the street. You know what I'm saying? He didn't tag up. He got a free ride. And then when he met me, because I'm born and raised in the Lower East Side, a lot of people didn't like him back in the days. And then I put him down with the crew, because everybody's down with the crew. And he, I put him down with CNS, CBS, and other good city I said, yo, wait up. He's down with a heavy hitter crew now. And that's how he got his respect, you know, to me. And for me, showing the street style and how we live in the lobby style. Right. Okay. So when I interviewed um, Al Diaz, who obviously used to go oh. by the name of uh, Samo, Samo with uh, with with Jean Michel Basquiat. Um, in my mind, and I hope I hope you know you take this a compliment, and I, I've said the same thing to Al Diaz. Is almost like. You know, he was painting partners with Jean-Michel Basquiat. It's almost like in history that you were kind of painting partners with Keith Haring. But two of them have died and their market is completely blown up and you two are still alive. And for me, 
you're the young the, the unsung uh, heroes of the street art community because as you just said there la um out diaz was a thoroughbred you know street artist you were a thoroughbred street artist and keith harring and jean-michel basquiat they weren't really known until they met you guys for graffiti or even for public street art. They were more, you know, like you said, studio, which is nothing wrong with that at all. Um, but, you know, the facts are, without uh, forging a relationship with you guys, they might not have been where they are today as far as the market is concerned. So so um, let's talk about that then. So, you know, like when Jean-Michel Basquiat died and also Keith Herring, you know, obviously it was sad, but what was the feeling like in and amongst the community of street artists and collectors in New York, what was that like? Well, to me, I'm a graffiti artist. You know, I, I don't, I don't know how uh, BS that man that you're talking about that collaborated with Samo. I knew Samo. I knew John Biscuit. Yeah, we hanged out. You know what I'm saying? I have did a painting with me and Toxic it was in a gallery. And me and Tasha was battling each other at Wild Style. Wild Style is when you get a marker and you write your name nonstop on the Pepsi glass. Basquiat came. He said, what's going on between these two graffiti writers? And other graffiti writers said, oh, they're just battling each other and graffiti. I won that the battle. But me and Tasha, we became friends. And Basquiat had bought that painting that me and Toxie was doing. He said, I want both of those paintings. <coughs> and when we went down there to John Street, he opened a suitcase and went and threw me a thousand, thousand for me and Toxie. And, and back in the day, they had a gallery called Fun Gallery. Fun Gallery was run by Patty Gaster. Patty asked her what she gave the Philly writers the opportunity to show their work there. I don't think you ever heard of Patty Aston. I haven't, no. She, okay, her name is Patty Aston. She gave the opportunity for the Philly writers to show their artwork there and sell their artwork there. But remember, us the Philly writers, we love to paint. I wasn't a businessman. A lot of the Philly writers wasn't a businessman. These people were business. They wanted to make money off of the art. And that's how the art scene is exploded, you know? Right. And that's how it was. And, you know, I met, I used to hang out with Andy Warhol. People said, I used to go to schools, high school, and they said, I tell the kids who's, I'm hanging out with Andy Warhol, and the teachers, they like, are you hanging out with Andy? I said, I would take a photograph. I would go to Union Square, the factory, where he had a studio. I said, Andy, the teachers don't believe that I know you. He takes a Polaroid camera, which he always carries, took a picture, wrote me a letter. I took it to the teacher, put it on the table. She was so, you know, and I stopped going to school after that. I dropped out of school to do my art. And, you know, he was part of that, you know. So he learned lots of things from me. He learned how to read, go to markers. This is a marker. You know, he didn't, he had thousands of these. These markers, you twist it off, and you could put ink on it, and you refill it, you know? And I showed them how to refill markers, showed them how to spray, and things like that. And that we had our first show at Tony Schiavone Gallery in 1980. In 1980, at Tony Schiavone Gallery, it was a sell-out show. You know, he sold everything. And I got a show right now in San Luis, which is a, a chess piece that I paint on chess, and it's right here. It's San Louis, the gamut, the keep having chess exhibition. I got the Museum of Boston, and then I got the Museum of Graffiti. So I got shows right now, all the way running up to June. So if you ever in New York or, you know, Boston, San Louis, stop by these shows, you know, when you see the LA2 shows, it's like, I'm still doing my art. You yeah. know, I'm very young. And I'm the last of the Mohicans with yeah. that crowd. That, you know what I'm saying? I'm the last, last one. Yeah. There's no more basket. <clears throat> Keep having, you know what I'm saying? And yeah. then I got Candy Sharp, which Candy Sharp wasn't a real figure either. 
he just got a free wa- a free ride, you know, Kenny Sharp, you know. And it's like I just I could go on and on. But people, you know, I'll be telling the truth. I got people that come all over the world and they send me emails if this is the original because a lot of people want to hear the truth. I was there, I lived it. And the reason why I'm here, because I like the woman, Keith Han Keith was gay. And I said, yo, once you show me respect, I show you respect. I don't care what you are. And everything been smooth sailing like that. You know, even with Andy, they all approached me. And I said, listen, I'm born and raised in the lower South. And that's how it is in the art world. Right? You say you're from London? Yeah. Yeah, London. Right now, there's an artist in London. Which his name is Thick. I know. I was going to ask you about him. I he's one of my favorite artists. You've you've collaborated together. I collaborate with him. I teach him about the art world and everything. Every day I talk with Thick, and we doing collabs and things like that. I was I, right now. I feel to be doing a traveling show, but with this epidemic thing going on, <clears throat> it's hard for me to travel. I had everything set up for this year. I was going to go to London to have a show with Stick. Wow. Right? Where, you, where you guys at? Yeah. People are going to go there. You know, Stick is doing the sculptures in the park. Yeah. Yeah, that's correct. I, mean, I had something real big. We had something. She handles everything, you know? Yeah. And uh, we had something real big. I was supposed to go to London, but, you know, right now, thanks for it. I can't travel right now because everything is, you know, what's happening right now. But I'll be there soon. Believe me. Well, look, uh, part of the reason why I wanted to interview you is obviously to hear your story, hear about, you know, where you're at right now, talk about the future. But more importantly, is to forge a relationship because our company, Woodbury House, we have only really ever represented only a few artists and 95% of our concentration is in Hamilton. We've done that since 2014. We've done a big show last year at the Saatchi Gallery. You've heard of Saatchi, right? It's, it's huge. Um, we've done collaborations. We've got in some of the biggest publications in the world. And now what we want to do is start telling the story of the affiliates. You know, people like Crash, people like LA2, people like Out Diaz, people like, I know, Days, you know, you know, I think I think what what we pride ourselves on, unlike a traditional gallery, is storytelling, and I think that we've told the story of Richard Hamilton so well that we've amassed a huge amount of clients, a huge amount of collectors, and also a huge amount of investors who've all made money and 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 really happy with their portfolios, and we want to start doing that with other people. And with you, uh, LA, you know, um, I know you're you know, you're, you're, you're very, uh, you know, outgoing as far as, you know, working still, like you like to collaborate uh, with other artists. And I think you like to venture into different, different kind of um, demographics as well. So this is my next question. Um, collaborations, t- take an artist out, out the equation for a second, but you know, like some, some artists like to collaborate with clothing companies, Levi's, Nike, Converse, Adidas, that kind of stuff, because, I think it allows a, another audience to acquire your work, but for a different medium. What what organisations have you ever collaborated with? Well, I, I just did a couple of collabs, you know. When it comes to clothes, I do my own clothes. I've got my own pants on. You know, I know. Like two pants. Yeah, they're sick. Very cool. You know, Vapor 95. I did, you go to Vapor 95, Vapor 95, you see my stuff. It's all LA2. You go on, and you go to my website, LA2, the com, yeah. and it gives you all the information <clears throat> that I've been up to and what I'm doing. I don't collaborate too much with artists. You know, I'm always, they always come looking for me. I don't come looking for them. You know? Just like he said, he was in New York. He had a show in New York in the gallery. One of the dealers came. I was sleeping. I didn't want to go downstairs. My wife said, hey, the kid is from London. You should go downstairs and meet him. Went downstairs and he's like, Oh, you are they too? Here's a black book. Would you sign it for me? I signed it for him. And then he was like, Wow, I've read so much about you, you know? And I would love to, you know, one day do a collaboration with you. And we just did a collab. We had a, sh- we had a, sh- I had a, a, sh- a show, had a couple of collabs. They all sell out. Everybody loves our collabs. 
You know what I'm saying? The yeah. man still does it. Like, so, you know, the fashion, I've been doing, a lot of my art was great in fashion. You know, I got, I done pillows. If you go to my studio, if you have a New York, come by my studio, you can see everything I do. I do clothes. I got my hoodies and everything. Have you ever collaborated with uh, a brand like an Adidas or a Nike or something like that? No, I didn't get Nike, you know, these name brands, you know, that you're talking about. You should, I don't, you know, I do my own stuff, you know. This is a, a book that me and Keith did our first show. Right. At Tony Chaprani Gallery. And, you know, and people, you know, I will welcome it. You know, is that stuff? Yeah, well, cool, really cool. If if, uh, if a good name brand comes and want to participate and do something, we can do something together. Yeah, you know, yeah. yeah this it's... is the first book that Keith Harris ever did. The Three Eyes Face at Tony Chaparral Gallery. Yeah, I, I recognize and, you that. You know, and it's so funny. I went and I bought this book myself because the foundation never gave me one. Really? You know, I bought five hundred dollars on this book. You see, yes, the foundation. Oh my God, this is of um, LA two. And when they see this, see this whole book here, and when they see these lines and everything, they think it's Keith Haring. Keith Haring do nothing here. This is all LA two. Huh. Where do you see a Keith Haring? So I got to teach the public, and the public got to learn that hey. There's an artist behind Keith Haring. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But at the 1980s, remember, I'm Puerto Rican. They white. You know, as Puerto Rican, we got to work double hard. You know what I'm saying? I hear you. I hear you. And this is me and Keith. Look, my God. Look. Look how proud Keith is to be with, with me. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, even if he can look. This is, look, look what he does. His stuff is just the babies and the dogs. Once he adds the lines and everything, it changes. And you see my tag. Yeah. You know, that's a young 14 year old kid. So he said, yo, let me work with this kid here because this kid knows a lot. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. About art, you know? So, and thank God I'm still alive and I'm still doing my art. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, look, we would love to work with you and maybe collaborate in some way um, and, and definitely get you over to London. So uh, go, going back to your collaborations then, obviously you've collaborated with Stick. I do really li like uh, Stick's artwork. I think he's got a very bright future. I, I, I did, you know, I did collaborate with Stick. I did collaborate with Richard. When I paint, when I do collaboros, I make sure it's the right artist, you know. It's not just any artist that I do collaborate with. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? What's, uh, who's and been your favorite? The store. There, 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 there's a Ferrucci store that was opening in London. There and is. They invited me because they wanted to, a Ferrucci store and, that they opened in London, which they invited me to go paint to make it seem like the Ferrucci store that we painted in 1983 in Italy. So they wanted the same art. As it was in 1983, the original Gucci store in Italy. Now they moved to London. That was one of my game plans this year to go paint the store over there too. You know, to paint for Gucci. They just moved over there. Um, it's only around the corner from here. So I'm actually in London, in London, Soho, London. And literally two streets away is where that uh, Furucci uh, store is. It's really, really cool. Um, so out of you, you've co collabed with. Um, Keith Haring, you've collabed with Kenny Sharp, you collab with Richard Hamilton and Stick. No, no, not, not too much with Kenny Sharp, you know, because Kenny Sharp, when me and him started it, we was cool, and he did a little war, and I went up, and I tagged my name on it, and he got a little bit, you know what I'm saying, a buddy, a buddy of Keith Haring, because, you know, he got a free ride to Keith Haring, and he's always saying that Keith Haring, the foundation, had paid me. When Keith Harry passed away, me and him did a lot of artwork that was never, I never got paid for. You know what I'm saying? That the foundation had kept, you know? And they put it out in these museums and stuff like that. When I went, they had a show at the Whitney Museum. I said, who's LA2? And the person said, LA2 is a, a black guy that passed away. I said, hold up. I'm LA2. I wrote my name. LA2 
everybody started freaking out. I said the black guy that passed away was one of the most. That was Keith Harris' lover. You know, he passed away. So remember, I'm the Puerto Rican, Keith Harris the white one, and one of the most is the black one. So it was a three, you know what I'm saying? Right, right. I, I understood. What what was it like, um, you know, collaborating with someone like Keith Haring then? Was he easy, easy, easy going to work with? Was he hard work? You know, was he was he was he a nice guy? Keith was he a mean guy? Me, you know, Go on. For me, Keith, like I said, once I told him I love women, once you show me respect, I show him respect, it's smooth standing. But in the neighborhood that I'm from, the Low East Side, remember back in the eighties, a lot of people they like gay people. You know, they find out you gay or whatever. They didn't like it then. I I was like I could, and when I was going to school, they were like, LA, you're making money because, you know, this guy is gay and things like that. And if I fed into that, and every day I'd be fighting every day, you know what I'm saying? But I didn't feed into that. So, you know, Keith, Keith was like an absorber. He absorbed everything I had taught him and everything, you know? Yeah. And his first, Keith's shows was never alone. You know, they say Keith had his first solo show. It wasn't the first solo show. It was me and Keith. They gotta say Keith. You gotta get the art history right. You know what I'm saying? They gotta say Keith Haring and LA too. The way people and everybody are recognizing and giving the props now. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes your props come later and sooner when I'm still here. You know what I'm saying? The people that any graffiti writer would say, "Yo, it wasn't Keith Haring. It was LA too." You know, Fab, Bob, Freddie. You know, everybody. You know, you know. Yeah. And Kenny Sharp, you know, you know, Richard, you know, all the real graffiti writers, no, it wasn't, it, went up. it wasn't Keith Harry. it was Keith Harry and L.A. too. Yeah, what was, you know? um, so what? Gotta, the art history got to get it right, you know, they ain't got the art history, they're not, they're not telling the art history the way it should be told, you know, us is, I, I, it's not the thing that's, that's happening that people don't And what is art? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I guess. Well, this is the more more than enough reason for you, which I know you are doing anyway, to to be out there, tell your story, and obviously make sure that you rewrite history because um, you know it's the, it's the truth. But yeah, so question I want to ask you, um, La Two. What was uh, what was Richard Hamilton like? Because I've worked on his market for so long, you know, I, I did get the pleasure of meeting him, but I've obviously, you know, worked on his market for such a long time. I'm completely immersed in in, in his work. What was he like as an ind- individual, and how was it like uh, collaborating with him? Well, to me, like I said, Richard, you know, he was a uh, he was cool with me. You know what I'm saying? He showed me he showed me a lot of respect out of all the artists. He was the one artist that always would speak up and say, yo, this is LA too. You know what I'm saying? And I would go to his studio, which he had on the land street, you know, and I would hang out with him. He, he would have a lot of paintings. And I also had some dealers that would buy the artwork that me and him collaborated. Richard was a, he who cut to my studio. I was in the, when I had my problems with drugs in the rehab center and he had passed away on October of Halloween, like three years ago, I believe it was three years ago. He had called my called my wife on the cell phone when he was in the hospital. And he was like, could I speak to LA? But my wife didn't understand what he was saying. Well, he was like, on, he was very, very sick. But he was trying to reach out for me. I knew why he was, I knew why he was trying to reach out for me for. But, you know, I was getting treatment, getting better myself, which I am better now. And, you know, Richard was good, man. You know what I'm saying? And now, you know, I got the Richard Hamilton, you know. I have people that say they got a Richard. Now they got all these big Richard Hamilton popping out out of everywhere. You know what I'm saying? Because you know how that goes. When the artists die, everybody want to make their money. So now they got all these big Richard popping out everywhere. And I have people coming to my studio. I got a Richard Hamilton. Um, this is his last painting that he did. I'm like, you know, I don't go there too much with other people, you know, when it, it comes to this stuff. Because people buy art when the artist is dead. Don't come to me saying you got this, you got that when the artist is dead. 
Come to me when the artist is alive. You know, say, I got this from this artist when he's alive. Yeah. Don't wait till he's dead. It's like Andy Warhol. Every millionaire wants an Andy Warhol in their house. Yeah. Did you ever meet Andy? No. So I hanged out with Andy. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I was there with Andy. I was at the studio. I say, Andy, chill out with LA, you know? Yeah. Could I? Can I? Can I ask you about um, your take on the art market as as an investment? Because it seems to me more and more and more people are getting involved with art to stockpile it, to collect it, to preserve their money, and to make money. Because let's have it right, you know. Your typical areas of investing, stocks and shares, property or banks, in times of coronavirus lockdown, they're losing money. But it seems to be that the art market is thriving. You know, it's, it's going up and up and up and up. I mean, look at Banksy. Look at Jean-Michel Basquet. Look at Andy Warhol. Look at look at their market. It's, it's booming. Um, what's your take on it, uh, L.A.? You know painting from certain artists. Right now, it's like a lot of people are losing their jobs. There's a lot of, you know, things happening in the world. So a lot of people have art and they just study their art as a bargain. You know, everybody want to buy their art as a bargain now. Like gold, you know what I'm saying? So that's what's happening now in the art world. You know, they got people that, you know, go buy any kind of painting. That's a bargain. They don't. They don't want to give the price that it's going, really going for. But yeah, that's what's happening now. Yeah, because. Uh, when we saw Jean-Michel Basquiat pass away many years ago, his market's gone, you know, from strength to strength. And in 2017, a piece went for $110.5 million. Now, you as an artist who who paved the way for many other artists and influenced and gave them inspiration, how does it make you feel when you, you see one of your peers, you know, one of yeah. their pieces in Chris's or Sotheby's fetching that kind of money? How does that make you feel? I wish it was alive to see it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it would make me feel great to see it because, you know, a lot of these artists, they wasn't making that money when they were alive. You yeah. know, sometimes you know how that, you know how the game is played in the art world. Well, the art is the artist. Yeah. Yeah. And, with, with yourself, uh, LA, um, I know you said you've got loads of plans and obviously coronavirus has, um, you know, prevented them happening immediately. But let's just say like six months from now, you know, when things are back to normal, etc. What are your plans? Because, uh, again, we would like to, you know, definitely work alongside you in some capacity. Um, what, what, you know, what, what are you going to be doing over the next two, three, four, five years? What's your plans? Well, my plan is like I've always been doing. You know, I got a gift and it's called painting and doing art. And I'm just going to continue doing my solo shows. You know what I'm saying? I'm just going to be doing my art and just, you know. Yeah. Hope be in London. We we'll show out there, you know. And just continue doing my art, you know. Yeah. And keep painting. That's what, you know, just especially now. Now is the time that a lot of people need to do art, to express themselves through love, because art is love, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And what was that, was it your first, you know, um, you know, going back to your early days, I know you said you express yourself through through painting, which is love. Um, how come you didn't go down another route, such as, I don't know, your more conventional route, getting a job, or maybe becoming a, an athlete, or something like that? Why was it painting? Why was it being, you know, a street well, artist? Well, I was an athlete, because... Before, you know, I used to go to the boys club. You know, you, I don't know if you know what's a boys club. Boxing? You know what's a boys club? Where it's a whole bunch of kids. They would go, they would play pool, they would go swimming. Oh, they would right. go ping pong, you know, things like that. You right. know, I love swimming. You know, I'm in shape, I don't know. Right now I got COPD from smoking too much. I would like to do something for COPD for the smoking and stuff like that. Yeah. 
But, you know, I'm, I'm still here, you know what I'm saying? I ride my skateboard when I could. I ride my skateboard. I get on my bike, you know, when I could. When yeah. Good days. Yeah. So sorry, the uh, the line keeps and cutting out slightly. It must be the internet connection. But um, okay. So um, LA, what's your what's your view on the art market now to where it was back in the the eighties and nineties? Like, how have you seen it evolve with with the introduction of you know um, the internet, social media, that kind of thing? What what's what's your take on the art market now? Well, the art market is now. You know how it is. You know, it's like. Incredible with the social media, you can, you know, the painting, the whole world sees it, and the internet, the whole world sees your know, art. Right. So you know, that's how people are doing their things right now. The computers, you know, they're not even doing art anymore. They go art computers, you know, you just sit in front of the computer and paint all day. I guess. Yeah. Have you noticed, like, you know, a different demographic getting involved with with purchasing art now than 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 let's say back when when you first started? Well, I'm not like an art collector. You know what I'm saying? I'm an artist. You know what I'm saying? No, but no. But I'm saying is, you know, what what I was saying to you, LA, is you know you're an artist. What the 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 type of people that acquire in your work or your affiliates works? How how has that demographic evolved and changed over time? Because I, I can imagine p- people that are buying now are, are, might be slightly different to the type of people that were buying back in the eighties and nineties. Or would you say they're quite the same now? I don't know because you know uh, if you could afford to buy somebody's artwork, then even if you like it, buy it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, if you could afford it. I like, I, I'm a type of artist, when you come to my shop, I might sell a canvas for this price, but I also think about the kids in the neighborhood, you know, I do sneakers, you know, t-shirts and things like that. My art is for everybody. It's not once you become famous and stuff, like, you know, don't let nobody else afford your art, just the rich, you know? Yeah. To me, that's not cool. My, you know, back in the days, when we was tagging up, you come with a, a jacket on and we'll paint on your jacket. You come with a hat on, we would tag up on your hat. Now you got these artists that they ain't exclusive. They tell you, I'm exclusive. I can't do that. You know? And I'm like, what? You can't write on the book? You can't. No, I'm exclusive. So, you know, to each stand on. You know what I'm saying? Mm. But if you want to get an LA too, you can always get an LA too. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, do you know the, uh, the, 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 the pants, as you call call them in America, or, or your trousers, and also you've got your the canvas over your left hand shoulder. I take it that's one of yours. What um is that one of yeah. yours? Mm-hmm. Yeah. What? Yeah, what, it's one of my pieces. What um what what inspired you to to have that kind of um style? Because you know, looking at your Richard Hamilton over your right hand shoulder to your own piece you guys have got completely different styles this, this is at my studio which you came to my studio and he, and i had a canvas and i gave it to him and he and he said i like to sit right there i want to do a self-portrait of you so you can see me he did it three times and then he wrote la2 everywhere you can see it yeah i'll see it and then he signed it in the bottom because you know when he came he knew I was like, he knew what I knew. We was graffiti writers. So us graffiti writers are everywhere. So he was like, LA2 tag is everywhere. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and it was like, and things about me, when I meet artists, I'm not that type of person that, you know, say, give me a painting and things like that. You know how some people ask for painting. I was like, if he does it, he does it, you know? Yeah. I wasn't a real good collector. You know, I'm, yeah. I like to know they like to me and we just hang out and that's how it works. You know what I'm saying? Your style, your style quite naturally, only because it's more commercialized, um, you know, pe- people do refer, you know, d- d- are going to affiliate it to the Keith Haring type of style. But when I look at it, it has a, an Andy Warhol feel to it slightly as well. So what or who or how, what, what sort of gave you that style? What influenced it? 
Well, I was good for you, writers. You know, everybody's gifted. You know, some people are gifted to be singers, actors. Mine was just, you know, painting. You know what I'm saying? That was my gift. And, you know, and it's a gift that I continue doing. And, I, and, and it's a style that, you know, that everybody likes and everybody can enjoy. Yeah. Okay, so you you just come up with this style that you've got right now, just just by kind of chance, and it was organic. It just it's, it's like I only do when I do a painting, you only get one of a kind of like two. You can never get the same painting twice. You know what I'm saying? I have people coming to my wife room over and asking her to a lady does a painting just like this, and, and I, I can't do it. You know, because once it once it comes out, once I put those lines. Those lines are there, you know. I can't do the same painting twice. It will never happen. We've got a uh, Richard Hamilton shadow head, and then round the edge of it is the LA2 lions. I think you've done a series of, the, of those, didn't you? No, I didn't. Did, well, I did Richard's. I did a few paper drawings, and I also did one of dedication to him. You know, because remember, these artists, I hang out with them. They hang out with me for so many years together. After a while, you know, you know how to do the, the art or whatever. You know what I'm saying? So anyway, yeah, Richard, you know, I like the Richard. But he's in a better place now. You know what I'm saying? He went through, it wasn't good at the end for him, but he's in a better place. Yeah, for sure. Because I know he had, you know, the cancer of the face and he, you know, was was, was uh, deteriorated. And he looked like he was in pain. So... Yeah, yeah, he's probably probably in a in a in a much more comfortable place now, which is which is good. Um, look, going back to you know, sometimes they say the best career move an artist can make is when they sadly pop their clogs and pass away, um, because their their market tends to go up, as you said. Uh, Richard's market since he's passed away in two thousand seventeen definitely has gone up quite aggressively um you know one of his pieces in 2019 fetched under the, under the hammer over half a million um where do you see his market going financially over the next few years yeah but that's what i remember you know what i'm saying his market you know i don't know what's going on right now they probably millions of people trying to fight for his control of his market right now so i really don't know what's going on with him right okay Okay, um, and, and with 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 your with your market then uh, LA two, um, what sort of high hopes and, and vision have you got got for it? Because quite naturally, when everyone does pass away, what would you like to see happen to your own market in twenty, thirty, forty years time? Well, I just live for today. You know what I'm saying? I don't look down that line. You know what I'm saying? I just live for today. Right now I'm doing art. I just did a little chess piece for at the museum in St. Louis, and I like to see all the little kids playing chess with my on the LA two board. You know what I'm saying? On the chess board that LA two created. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, that's cool. I do admire people that live uh, live in the here and now. Um, I've got to admit, uh, my mind just because I'm in business for myself. I can't help but thinking about the future sometimes and it makes you feel like you're under pressure. I mean, it's good to set goals, but I need to live in the, the here and now a bit more. So I'm definitely going to take that bit of advice away from uh, this podcast today. Um, LA2, can I ask you a question? Where can people find you if, they, if you want them to find your work or follow your journey? Well, they can go to LA2, graffitiartist.com. Lovely. Right there, you go to LA2, the 3 audiencecom and you see everything what I'm up to and what's happening. Great stuff. I keep it simple, you know. And what about your uh, Instagram, social media? LA2, L-E-S. You go to LA2, L-E-S. L-E-S. All right. Like Loi Isa. Perfect. Cool. Um, like I mentioned to you, LA, we would like to, you know, open up the channel of communications with you and potentially some point this year, you know, do, do, some, do some projects together because, like I said, we pride ourselves on storytelling and you're, you know, if we're going to talk about street art from the 80s, you know, you can't, you can't do, you can't talk, you can't, you can't talk, talk about a story without including yourself because you're one of the OGs and thoroughbred artists from, from back in the day. 
Well, I but you know where to find me. You know, if you're in the city, come visit me. My door's always open. And, you know, give a big shout out to my man, Stick, you know? Yeah. And, you know, soon I'll be there. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Stick's an incredible artist and uh, I would love to see you guys work on something live in London. That would be incredible. Um, this is going to be the last question then, okay? Um, so when I got into business for myself, I came up with a slogan and the slogan goes like this, be happy, never content. So if I were to ask you, LA2, what does be happy, never content to you? What is your interpretation of that? Well, that's 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 how we gotta go day by day, you know. Be grateful for me. I like being grateful. You know what I'm saying? I like being grateful to my wife, her family. You know, being grateful, for good friends. You know, just being grateful. You know, and all we need now is a nice big hug from everybody right now, and that's what make me content. It'll make me happy. You know what I'm saying? I'm with you oh, on that point. And also love your dog. Love- also love your dog. Because my dogs drive me nuts, and they—they don't want to keep me happy every day. Because I gotta walk them. <laughs> Listen, um, I would love love to do a love to get some collaborations going with you. So let's let's keep up uh, the, the 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 communication. We are going to take a trip. Uh, the moment we're allowed to get over to New York, we're going to take a trip over there, and I'm going to revisit you. I'm going to visit you. Um, hopefully, we can do like a part two, maybe face to face. Uh, we can get some pieces from you. We can talk about projects. I think there, there's definitely some business that we can do together, LA2. You sort of broke up there, uh, LA2. But look, I'm going to love you and leave you, man. So uh, let's uh, thank you for your time, and I'll be in contact, all right? Thank you for having me. God, God bless. bless. Take care.